Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we are changing the mental health narrative, bringing hope and solutions. Here's your host, Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. Dr. Joel Lubar received his Bachelor of Science and Ph.D. from the Division of the Biological Sciences and Department of Biopsychology at the University of Chicago. Dr. Lubar was responsible for developing the use of EEG biofeedback or neurofeedback as a treatment modality for children, adolescents, and adults with attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. This started with his controlled studies back in the 1970s. This application of neurofeedback has become widespread in clinics and schools throughout the United States, Canada, Australia, Israel, and Japan. Currently, more than 1,500 healthcare organizations are using the EEG biofeedback protocols that Dr. Lubar has developed. Well, Dr. Lubar, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's delightful to see you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to talk with you. I was hoping you could start off by telling us a little bit about how you got into the work you do and what drives your passion for it. Okay. Well, I graduated way back uh, in 1961 um, at the University of Chicago as an undergraduate, and then in 1963, also from the University of Chicago in the neuroscience area, in biological psychology, and was doing research of a lot of different types of research, primarily basic research involving animals and this sort of thing until around 1970, 71. And then I decided, you know, uh, I'm going to start working, trying to do things for the human condition that I think would be uh, to try to advance uh, work with people that would be helpful to them in clinical medical settings and so forth. And there was some early research that showed that it was possible to train people that had who had epileptic seizures to actually control their seizures and sometimes reduce them significantly. And I got interested in that work. And the fellow who started that was Dr. Robert, uh, Barry Sturman at UCLA. And uh, also he had a laboratory support of the VA hospital uh, in the uh, San Fernando Valley, Valley I'm sorry, in Los Angeles. And uh, he did the study on a single child in which he reduced the seizures significantly. And I, that was very interesting. And I thought, well, we have a laboratory, we have all the equipment to do this. Let's see if we can replicate this work. So we worked with a, a larger number, I think it was about eight, eight individuals, both adults and children that had significant severe seizures that were not controlled by medication or, or other techniques. And we were able to help a number of them really reduce the seizure activity using a technique at that time called EEG biofeedback. In other words, what we did was we could record their EEG patterns, both when they were having seizures and before they were having seizures, look at the abnormalities and to set up a program so that when those abnormalities appear in the EEG, they can learn to block them. And this is called neurofeedback, EEG biofeedback or neuro because it has to do with the brain, neurofeedback. And uh, so that was you know, one of the early works that we did. And then at the same time, I noticed that as these individuals brought their seizures under better control, they also are able to attend and focus and concentrate better because that was often my side problem that they were having. And so I decided to try uh, with my students a program for training children that have what we now call ADHD. They didn't call it that at that time. They called it hyperkinetic disorder of childhood because they were often very activated, very active, running around all the time. Uh, but uh, we found that it was possible to control that as well. And our laboratory and my work was the first in the whole world to train ADHD using biofeedback or EEG neurofeedback. And that's spread ever since then. I mean, it's one of the largest applications of neurofeedback today all over the world. And uh, other things became treatable as well. Anxiety, depression, you know, even addictive disorders uh, and many different kinds of learning disabilities. And it turns out there's over 150 disorders that are now treated routinely all over the world 
using these techniques. Now, it's important to point out, however, that it's not a standalone technique. It's not like you just, you know, hook a person's brain waves up, you know, with a device and run them through an amplifier and show them a, a display. And as long as they can control their display, they're changing their EEG. You have to integrate this technique with other things, usually therapy, sometimes medication. In other words, it's, it's part of a whole program of techniques to help these patients. Wonderful. So how has it progressed over the years? How has the science advanced? The science has advanced very nicely, but not as fast as I'd like to see it advance. And what I mean by that is, you know, the, the court of science, so to speak, the gold standard are what are called randomized controlled studies. Usually where, you know, one group gets an active treatment, another group gets a quote, placebo treatment, which will not hurt them in any way, but it doesn't apply the, the active ingredient. And to see if they differ, uh, there are many, many experimental designs. And there are many studies that have been published in, in many of these areas uh, that I mentioned, depression, anxiety, addictive disorders, attention deficit, seizures, and so forth, that show that it, it really does make a difference. But uh, I think that we need a lot more studies of that kind. And the reason we do is because even at the present time, even though there are literally thousands and thousands of patients worldwide that are treated, and you know, several thousand practitioners worldwide using this technique, uh, the uh, coverage by third-party payers, insurance and others, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, government agencies, is not as good as it could be. And uh, in order to have that happen, it is going to be necessary to have even more and more controlled studies to convince the uh, scientific community, the medical community, and the insurance community that this is worth supporting. And so that is a long, tedious process. And uh, we have a number of professional organizations that are working very hard to see if this will happen. So you were talking before we started recording about how you're training other clinicians to yeah. use these, to develop protocols, et cetera. What are the catchphrases, words, labels, you know, the certifications that a patient or their family should be looking for to find a qualified professional to help them with this? Okay, there, there are two main certificating, certifying agencies. One is called the Biofeedback, International Biofeedback Certification Alliance, or BCIA. They have a website, bcia.org, and they certify people who are health professionals uh, that have learned how to use these techniques that have basic scientific background in many fields of science and neuroscience that are part of this field. Uh, and there is an examination that they have to pass and they have to renew these certifications. So uh, that's one level of certification. And that is primarily for practitioners who are going to do this in clinical settings and practices. The other certifying agency is the uh, quantitative EEG certification. And I'm on the board of that one. Uh, and this is to certify people who to become very expert at being able to analyze the EEG, understand what it means to set up protocols, and then also to then apply it in clinical settings. And that is another extensive certification program. It's a little bit more advanced. Uh, there are physicians and neurologists, as well as psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and other healthcare professionals that have uh, tried to, or getting, I should say, getting and using that type of certification. So one thing I do recommend, and that is, uh, if people are looking for a practitioner, let's say that you have a patient and they look They've heard about neurofeedback and they want to try it. How do I find a practitioner? One way is to go to our professional organization, ISNR.org, International Society for Neurotherapy and Research, ISNR.org. Uh, and there is not only very detailed discussion of what neurofeedback is and how it works and all of that, with lots of illustrations. Uh, but you can also, there is a portion of it which says find a practitioner. And it has lists of people who are certified in different parts of the country and in different countries to help them find a practitioner. 
And the problem is we don't have enough practitioners. So, for example, uh, here I am in South Florida, and we have, you know, a handful. There's probably less than five or so practitioners for the whole area of Miami and all the way up to Boca Raton. I'm in Pompano Beach. Uh, there are only a handful of practitioners, and there is quite a demand for treatment. So we need to have more people trained and certified, and we need to make it possible for patients to be able to uh, obtain this type of training. So what kind of an investment is it for a professional who wants to acquire the equipment and get the training for this? Well, first of all, let's say that somebody has pretty good background in neuroscience and all that. Uh, in order to do this, they need to have an amplifier that they can you know, connect up the individual's EEG and they can record anywhere from one location on the head all the way up to 19 locations simultaneously. And uh, these amplifiers range anywhere from five to uh, up to $20,000, depending on you know, how many channels they are and, and their, their quality. So they need a good amplifier. That's one thing. And then also they need this, the uh, program, software programs for analyzing the EEG and there are a number of those out there. So, you know, it, it, it is a, a significant investment. Maybe, you know, for less than $20,000, one can, a practitioner can get the equipment, you can get the software, you get the analysis software, they can get everything they need to do this. But the, the other part, which is even much more important, is they have to have the training. How do I hook these electrodes up? How do I look at the EEG and know if it's normal or abnormal? How do I read it? How do I analyze it? How do I use that information to set up training protocols? And that's primarily what I do. I train people how to do all of that. Now, of course, I've been in clinical practice. Uh, my wife, you know, um, may she rest in peace, she passed away four years ago. But we had a practice, Southeastern Neurofeedback Institute and Southeastern Biofeedback Institute, uh, going back to the 1975. And uh, we saw hundreds of patients, about several thousand patients. Uh, and we train them together. And uh, I still do training, but I do a lot of it, you know, remotely. People will ask me if I can come online and work with their patient while they are working with the patient and guide them how to do sessions. So I'm still doing training with real patients in that sense. Uh, but we, I've set up a, a program here in South Florida, uh, in an area nearby, called, I think it's called Coral Springs or Deerfield Beach. And uh, patients are seen there uh, for a variety of disorders. And the person who I trained to do this is very, very good. It's excellent results. He's been doing this for several years now. And it's a very thriving practice. And again, the demand is greater than the supply. We don't have enough practitioners, but we have a lot of people who need help. So what can you tell our audience about what a standard course of treatment is or what they should expect in terms of uh, how many sessions over what period of time. And, and you've already said that this as a treatment mm -hmm. should be integrated with therapy and some other things, but. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and that, that it's very important because you just can't put a person on a device and have them change, you know, some physiological measure whether it's traditional biofeedback for people learn how to relax muscles or increase blood flow to their arms or legs, you know, change certain or their breathing or their heart rate and things of that kind, uh, as well as training the, the brain waves themselves and other aspects of it. Uh, that, that's just part of the treatment. The question is, how do I integrate that information into my real life situation? How do I make these transfer uh, have we learned this when I'm in stressful situations, whether it's in family situations, home situations, if, if you're an adult with my children, if you're a child with my teachers, with my parents, in work settings and all of that. So that the, the transfer is the most important thing. And so that's where we integrate the neurofeedback with the uh, therapy if necessary. And with medications in some cases, you know, I have a number of trainees uh, Consult these were psychiatrists, some have been neurologists, pediatricians, and uh, they use medications and that's fine. It's the, how to integrate the medical aspects of it with the neurofeedback. 
very important. So it and, all works together. And so what, what could someone expect in terms of a course of treatment? I know that you can't say, oh, there's five sessions or, but what's a range, an average range for someone who goes for a neurofeedback or QEEG neurofeedback training? Well, you, you know, very often we get very good results in anywhere from between 10 and 20, 25 sessions, which is much better than it used to be. It used to be before we had the more advanced techniques and equipment, we would take 40 to 50 or 60 sessions because uh, we were just training individual locations on the head, two or three locations. Now we're not only training 19 locations, but we're, we can train up to, uh, at the very top, over 11,000 connections between these different locations. In other words, what we're training now are networks, whole neural networks, of integrated connections inside the brain. And it used to be until about, oh, well, maybe about five years ago, uh, we could only train the cortex, you know, the outer layer of the brain itself. Now we can train uh, more than a dozen areas in the cerebellum and areas deep inside the brain, way down in the brain such as the thalamus, and I can name the other structures, but uh, you know, these are structures that are involved in regulation, of endocrine function, emotional regulation, you know, addictive behaviors, all kinds of things. So we, we, you know, we've really expanded this enormously. And you know, here's one of the advantages of, of EEG neurofeedback or biofeedback, or neurofeedback is a better term, and that is uh, the EEG changes very rapidly. And we can follow it, you know, up to 128 to 256 or even 500 times a second. So we can look at changes on an instant, almost instantaneous basis. Uh, and that gives us a great deal of uh, ability to work with these different connections that are continuously shifting and changing inside the brain. Uh, so that's one thing. Now, there's another technique which uh, and a number of our patients are referred to that, and that is to do the imaging techniques, such as the fMRI, or the MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, which can give you very precise and detailed information about the structure of the brain. Is there anything abnormal inside the brain? Cysts, tumors, calcification, you know, damaged tracts in the brain, you know, connections. The MRI is very good at that. And it is even possible to do MRI and neurofeedback. There are some studies out there where they train people to actually change that measure, which is a blood flow measure. It's called the bold response, blood oxygen level dependent response. You're measuring the, the, the change in oxygenation of the blood in different areas. The positive feature is that if you can train activity in very tiny areas, in fact, MRI can see structures as small as one millimeter. Uh, but the changes are slow. It takes at least 10 seconds to see a change in blood flow. So the feedback is, is very limited and you can't do it over and over again because you're putting a person in a, a large device with a strong magnetic field. So you know, there are sometimes some side effects from that. But it is now possible to actually record the, the, the brain waves, the EEG inside an MRI machine. So you can begin to combine these techniques together. And there are other imaging techniques as well. You know, there's the old CAT scan, computerized axial tomography, which shows your structure. There's a thing called SPECT scan, S-P-E-C-T, single proton emission tomography, which shows you whether blood is perfusing different parts of the brain properly. Is there enough blood flow to different areas? And then there's PET scan, positron emission tomography, which can look for abnormal uptake of uh, radioactive tracers is used to uh, look for tumors and follow the course of their development inside the body. So there, there are many, many wonderful imaging techniques and those combined with what we can do really give you a broad idea of what's, what's going on with a particular patient. Very detailed. Have people been using the QEG neurofeedback in a clinical setting with people where they have them uh, get activated emotionally and then watch the brain response and then retrain that in, in what they yeah, might call a memory yes. reconsolidation? We do. In fact, that, that, in fact, that's used both in the MRI as well as in neurofeedback as well. That is, that, you know, have them engage in an active task. 
It could be a visualization. Let's say a patient has chronic anxiety disorder and to look at the difference in their EEG on a moment to moment basis when they're experiencing you know, very anxiety provoking scenes as opposed to when we take them through a relaxation procedure. And we can see the differences. The other thing, good example is, you know, somebody has learning disabilities. Uh, we can see how the EEG looks when they're, you know, trying to read or trying to write or trying to interpret something that they've read. And if they have difficulty, we can see the difference between their performance in that situation as compared with the baseline. And the other thing that we do have for all of these different techniques is a very large normative database. In fact, there are several normative databases uh, that have anywhere between 500 and over 1,000 individuals of different ages. And so we statistically can compare you know, your EEG or my EEG to an age match database to see if, you know, which areas of the brain are outside of the normal range uh, and which connections are outside of the normal range. And then as we train, we train using the database to normalize that as much as possible. And, and we can even import this data directly into programs that graph the data on a session by session basis and do all kinds of nice statistical analyses to show whether or not things are moving from abnormal to normal. So all of this advanced technology exists now. In fact, I'm involved in one study that we're going to be presenting at our national meeting of uh, the uh, ISNR. It's coming up at the end of July, in which it, we took 120 children that had ADHD between the ages of six and 11. And uh, we looked at, you know, literally thousands and thousands of connections in their brain to see which particular sets of connections are most abnormal and typify that population. And we picked out a number of them. And as a result, now we can set up protocols to train those specific connections. And that gives us even more accurate ways of being able to normalize the brain. So we have, you know, we're gonna be doing more and more of that kind of evaluation. Wonderful. The idea that uh, the more you do that, the more you accumulate the data, the more refined you can make your protocols. That's an exciting thought. Yeah, the, the more refined the protocols are going to be for individuals with different disorders or combinations of disorders, because very rarely, I mean, when you work with a patient, they say, I have, an, I have a terrible anxiety problem. They may also be experiencing obsessive thoughts, and depression, other things that, you know, there's clusters of, of uh, conditions that go together. And so we, we try to work with a combination of them. So for example, in this particular study, we're looking at a, a two attention networks and executive function network, network that has to do with you know, pinpoint accuracy of thought processing called salience, a network which is called the default mode network, which is a network that people are in, which is a good network to be in under certain circumstances. It's when you kind of get into a very relaxed state and kind of fantasize and visualize and, and that's fine. Not, not a good place to be when you're in a classroom or right. you know, trying to understand something. But so children with ADD often lapse into that default mode network. Yeah, I have a great example of that. I remember years ago, there was a child in this classroom and had this kind of glossy look in his face and the teacher was lecturing and at the end of the lecture, the teacher looked at the little boy and said, do you have any idea what I've been talking about for the last hour? And the child said, no, but I had a great trip to Aruba. <laughs> this is what happens when you get into default mode network. You fantasize, you imagine, and it's good to, you know, I mean, artists, composers, writers need this very often to get the ideas and be able to use as a springboard to action. But then you have to be able to get out of it and get into the active processing network, such as the salience network, the executive function network, the attention networks. Otherwise, nothing gets done. You know, we've all met people who say, I have tons of good ideas, but I never wrote them down. I never did anything with them. Okay, so to go from that portion of the process to the active process of doing something, that's the next step. And so we try to help them with that. 
And it, it's fascinating for me to hear you say that these days it can go in 20 or 30 sessions that there can actually be significant retraining of the brain in that way. Yeah, but there's an important point, and that is when you, when you finish a session, or finish the 20 or 30 sessions, let's say the patient says, right, I don't feel anxious anymore, or I don't have this craving you know, to abuse you know, drugs or alcohol or whatever it is, because we work with a lot of addiction disorders, uh, and they're doing much better. You don't just say, okay, that's fine. That's all finished. No, it doesn't work that way. You phase them out gradually. You might start out with two or three sessions a week, and there are some severe cases where you see them every day. And over time, you reduce the frequency of sessions. And eventually, uh, you get to a point where they may be seen once a month, and then maybe after three months, and after another six months. And the message to them is always, if you feel that you're beginning to have problems with the, you know, the, the problem that you were working with, uh, feeling it's beginning to come back, you know, we may need to do a few booster sessions to get you back on track. But you have to follow the patients, you, you know, if you don't follow them. You know, look, look at it from another point of view. Let's say this somebody goes in, you know, for back surgery and because they've had, you know, an accident and the back, back is very severely damaged. Uh, let's say, you know, there's some dislocation of di spinal discs, and compression of some of the uh, nerve roots, and the surgeon can go in and release all that. Uh, but, you know, what happens often is sometimes scar tissue forms and it comes back again. So you have to, uh, after you have the surgery, you then have to go into physical therapy, maybe occupational therapy, you know, long-term exercise program to maintain the flexibility in, in the vertebral column. And if you do it right, you know, the, the problem may be under your control for many, many years. So neurofeedback's the same way. You have to really work with the patients and, and you know, they're a long-term commitment. So what's the, the length of time to, for a clinician to get trained in this? We've talked about the cost of the mm -hmm. am amplifier and, and then the software, but what's the, the length of time that someone would need to, because you're saying that we don't have enough clinicians. We don't. And so how long does it take a clinician to get trained in this where they can be actually effective with patients? Well, I mean, let, let's assume that the clinician you're talking about already has a lot of therapeutic skills, whether it's occupational therapy, physical therapy, psychotherapy, social work, you know, whatever it is, that they already have that. And they've already been practicing with patients using those techniques. So now it's a matter of adding the, you know, the neurofeedback and the QEG component. Um, if they work with us, you know, for approximately, oh, anywhere from six months to a year, uh, progressively they can begin to use these techniques with patients and, and do very well with them. It does take some time. It depends on how much background they've already had. And one thing I, I do, by the way, people have always asked me, well, what should you tell students who are going through this field? What kind of background should they get? And I tell them, I, this is what I said, I say, if you, the number of journal articles that are coming out in the neurosciences and in this field, are enormous. There's sometimes as many as 20 to 50 new papers coming out every month in different journals all over the world. I have stacks, you know, you know, stacks several feet high right here on my desk of papers coming out all the time. And I tell the student, if you take any of these papers and just open them up and look through them, that's what you're going to see. A lot of complex mathematics, you know, very advanced. And our field is really becoming sort of a branch of mathematical physics to some extent. Let's put it the other way around. Mathematical physics is often employed in trying to understand all these things. So I tell the new students that try to take as much math as you can tolerate, or if you can take physics when you're in college, because you're going to need that background to be able to read the literature in our field. It, it become, it's becoming very technical, you know, very involved. And don't try to scare them. I'm not trying to scare them at all. I say, you know, up to the ability that you can. And the other nice thing is that uh, if you go to YouTube, uh, there are wonderful presentations. I've done a few on there over the years too, from time to time. But there are wonderful presentations on quantitative EEG, on brain mapping, on network analysis. Some of those presentations are, are very easy to understand with very nice illustrations. Others are just nothing but very complex, higher mathematical equations, you know. Uh, there's a series on trying to understand how the fMRI works. It's about 75 lectures. And 
by the time you get into the more advanced lectures, it's just all mathematics. It's very complicated. But uh, again, you, know, you, you have to work to a certain level. Fortunately, and this is the good news, our, our certification examinations are not highly mathematical at all. They're very practically oriented. You know, how are you going to use this information? What does this particular abnormal EEG pattern, you know, look like? You know, what is a pattern that might be associated with anxiety look like? What is a pattern associated with depression look like? When you look at EEG patterns, how do you know what is really generated by the brain and is due to external noise or movement or art, what we call artifacts so that you don't misinterpret the EEG? So there, there is training involved. But that's, you know, I do a lot of that myself for people. And then there's the training about how to get, after you've done an assessment and you've compared it to the database, how you then develop a protocol for treatment yes. that can actually help train the individual through that, as you're calling it, either biofeedback or neurofeedback. Or neurofeedback, yes, yes. And, uh, and as I've heard this explained by other people who do QEG, that one of the theories is that your brain wants to make sense of things. Your brain wants... Mm -hmm. the input that you're experiencing to be smooth and consistent. And um, that part of what's built into the software when you're giving a corrective treatment is that when a person's able to maintain a certain desired brainwave state, then the picture they're looking at is smooth and the sound is consistent. And if they deviate from that, then the software instantly reads that and decides to sputter the sound or the picture and then the brain wants to wants yeah. to make a make it smooth again so you're literally with that instant feedback your brain is learning that's not, yes that is true now what we do is uh, when the patient comes in uh and they tell us you know we, we do a thorough evaluation of, you know why are they there and that, that may involve you know psychological testing what we call neuropsych testing if they having you know, problems in terms of educational or learning or cognitive problems um, and so forth. And once, once we have a, a clear history, a detailed history, you know, intake a session may take a couple of hours. And there may be some testing involved. So we understand, you know, who are you? What is your problem and how does it manifest itself? Then we do the quantitative EEG analysis. And let's say the patient is clearly identified that they, you know, extreme obsessive thoughts about things associated with extreme anxiety. And uh, so as a result of that, we now look at their brain EEG pattern, okay? And we go to those networks. And when we, when we pull those networks up, we know which connections are in those networks. And we can look at the patient's brain and say, okay, how many of those connections for those networks are really outside the normal range? And we can see that right away on the map. And on the connectome, it's called, where we can see all the different connecting lines, so to speak. And how deviant are they from the normative values? And once we've distinguished that, it's, and then we can set up a protocol saying, we're going to take you know, these particular frequencies of EEG, bands of the EEG, we use weak letters like theta and beta and alpha and gamma and so forth, which frequencies that we're going to train, which connections we're going to train, which areas are we going to train. Uh, and normalize. And yes, it's true that you know, when we set up the actual EEG neurofeedback itself, uh, from the patient's point of view, they don't have to look at the complicated EEG. Uh, they get a simple display. I'll give you an example of many displays. I have one particular one. I have about 30 of them, but this is one simple one. You see a little river, and every time they produce the right pattern, a fish jumps, and you get a little tone. And you can pick up whatever tone you want. It could be a bell or a gong, or it could be just a pleasant little sound of some kind. Now, what makes the fish jump? Well, what makes the fish jump is if they can produce the, quote, normal pattern for all the connections in, in that network that are outside of the normal range for a certain period of time, let's say for three quarters of a second or half a second, then the fish will jump. So they're producing the normal EEG for that period of time. Now it's, this is a very this is this is a very discrete kind of feedback. It only occurs when they're producing the right pattern. Uh, for children, sometimes people have used uh, movies of various kinds. So the child is watching a movie, 
And as long as they're producing the right pattern, the movie continues. When the pattern, when they're not producing the pattern, either the movie can pixelate, you know, fall apart, or it can change from color to black and white, or it can fade out. You know, things can happen to it so that it's no longer visible and they have to reconstitute it again. And there's a lot of detailed technique involved in doing this properly. But basically, what you're trying to do is, you know, tell them you're now producing the right EEG pattern. That is a normal pattern for somebody that has experience that you're having. In other words, let's say a patient's severely depressed, okay? Or they've had a traumatic brain injury. A lot of people have had, you know, traumatic brain injuries or strokes or whatever. Uh, when you're producing the normal pattern, everything in the screen looks the way it should. And when it deviates from that, you know, it immediately tells you that you're falling out of the normal range. And as you learn to produce this more and more consistently, we can graph this, we can show it to you over sessions. Now, are you also experiencing improvement? And, you know, we hope that, that, that there is a good correspondence when, when the pattern is, the normal pattern is there more of the time than the abnormal pattern, the patient says, yes, I'm not feeling as depressed as I did before. I, have, I can control my anxiety and work with them. Uh, social situations or in school if it's a child or whatever it is. Uh, I have control over the things that I'm concerned about much more. Now, sometimes, uh, and this is very interesting, let's say that we're doing a particular session and a particular session. And let's say the session is, oh, let's say uh, 40 minutes long and it consists of several sub pieces. We have a, a period of feedback and then a rest period, another feedback period and a rest period. And we always tell them, you know, you're going to get a certain score at the end of each of these, we call them rounds. And each round, we'd like you to beat the previous score. It means that you're showing learning during the session. And let's say that the patient is uh, doing very well at five rounds. Let's say. And round one, they get a certain score. Then let's, say, let's say 20 rewards a minute. The next round, they get 22 rewards a minute. The next round, they get 24 rewards a minute. And the next round, they only get 15. And then we say, okay, let's, we pause the session for a minute. And let's say, let's see if we can figure out why it went down. And the patient says, oh, well, I'm really trying to control my anxiety. And suddenly I had all these thoughts flood in my mind and just couldn't concentrate. And I started worrying about something. See, that's where you begin to get the insight. Okay, how can we deal with that? And that's where the therapy comes in. There are times sometimes when you really have to say, okay, maybe we need a couple of sessions where we just deal with those kind of problems and see how we can help you resolve them. It's the integration of the therapy with the feedback that really does the job. Great. You know? Wonderful. Yeah, it, it is important. It, uh, I, 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 there are very few, there, I, I would say this, when we were working with seizures, that was maybe one example where uh, we could just do the feedback itself and try to you know normalize the abnormal patterns in their EEG that would set off the seizures and there wasn't as much therapy involved but sometimes there was you know even there was sometimes necessary well if you take a breath and think about it we're wrapping up we've only got maybe five minutes left what what is an aspect of this that I haven't even asked you about that you'd want us to know about or no. Either an aspect of the work you do or something that you hope that people listening to this might be able to do to help you spread the word about it? Well, I think what we need to do is to, is to get more emphasis on the results that we're getting and try to get this information to people that, you know, would support this more. Because quite frankly, you know, and, uh, and unfortunately, uh, for a lot of patients, neurofeedback is only available to those that can afford to pay for it. And that's unfortunate, you know, we, we, it needs to be available to everybody. Uh, and the only way you're going to do that is to get insurance to cover, third party payers to cover. So we're working very hard to get the insurance companies to recognize what we're doing and not just say the term they like to use. Oh, this is experimental. You know, why should we pay for something that's experimental? You have to prove that it's for real. Well, that's, that's where the research comes in. And it's happening, but it's slow. It's slow. And we're doing everything we can to push this along. All of our professional organizations, uh, another one, AAPB, Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, 
all of these organizations have, you know, subcommittees and so forth that are working directly with the insurance companies, you know, sitting down with them. Here's some published research. You know, we think that, you know, this warrants you know, better coverage because that's the only way it's going to be available to everybody. And we want it to be available to everybody. And look at it this way. People uh, in my age group, maybe in your age group, you know, we, we depend on Medicare for a lot of coverage of our medical expenses. And uh, older people do have a lot of cognitive problems. Some of them have strokes and so forth and brain injuries. And uh, Medicare is very important for those people to be able to get coverage. And right now it's not very good. So that's our, our next goal was to get better coverage for this. The other thing is then we need more research in this country because if you pick up any of the journals that have neuroscience papers and, and papers on EEG and quantitative EEG and neurofeedback, the majority of them are being published in other countries. It's not, you know, it's not like there's no research here. I, I had a paper the other day was on one of these techniques and all the authors were from, were from Turkey and it was an excellent paper in a major journal. And we have papers from Spain, different South American countries and all over. And part of the reason is because in some of these countries, the governments really support this kind of research. Whereas here, you know, we have National Institute of Health, NIH, National Science Foundation. Uh, there are grants available, but sometimes it takes three, or three to five years to get a grant to do a study. It's a very tedious process. And most clinicians, they don't have the time to write grants. Right. And so it has to be done through universities. I have always had grant support in my laboratory. We spend a lot of time writing grants and getting contracts. So it's an evolving process, but the field is growing. It's growing very rapidly and more and more people are hearing about it. And that's good. Well, I thank you so much for sharing the time with us. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, delightful to finally meet you face to face and hear more okay. about the work you've been doing for a lot of years now. Yeah, I'm so. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm, I'm just, I'm anxious to keep listening, following your work and follow the developments. And, uh, okay. hopefully, uh, one day soon, it's going to be fully reimbursed through insurance and Medicare. Well, that's one of the goals. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with it. Okay. It's delightful to talk to you. All right. Thank you very much. Dr. Joel Lubar received his Bachelor of Science and Ph.D. from the Division of the Biological Sciences and Department of Biopsychology at the University of Chicago. Dr. Lubar was responsible for developing the use of EEG biofeedback or neurofeedback as a treatment modality for children, adolescents, and adults with attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. This started with his controlled studies back in the 1970s. This application of neurofeedback has become widespread in clinics and schools throughout the United States, Canada, Australia, Israel, and Japan. Currently, more than 1,500 healthcare organizations are using the EEG biofeedback protocols that Dr. Lubar has developed. Dr. Lubar has published more than 150 papers, numerous book chapters, as well as eight books in the areas of neuroscience and applied psychobiology. One of these books was on the QEEG databases for neurotherapy, published in 2003. He has been a regional editor for the Journal of Physiology and Behavior and an associate editor for Biofeedback and Self-Regulation. He has held the position of assistant professor at the University of Rochester and then associate professor and full professor at the University of Tennessee. Dr. Lubar also had a postdoctoral fellowship at UCLA in neuroscience. He is now professor emeritus of the University of Tennessee. Dr. Lubar was the past president of the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback and was the president of the International Society for Neurofeedback and Research. He has also been president of the Academy of Certified Neurotherapists, which has offered specialty certifications in EEG biofeedback as a part of the Biofeedback Certification Institute of America. Dr. Lubar was listed in 2019 by Stanford University in the top 2% of the world's scientists based on research and publications and impact on their field. 
You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening. 